Welcome all. Today is Tuesday, Tuesday, May 3rd, the eve of uh, the next FOMC meeting. Very special room we have today. Uh, Michael Belkin, you're going to bring down the house. I've never seen a room quite like this. Normally, there might be two, three, four hundred people pre registered to listen. I think there were like eight or nine hundred, some crazy number like that. So, Michael, um, people want to hear you, not just because of your wonderful voice, but rumor has it you've had a good call on the market. I'm going to dispense with my usual monologue, and I'm just going to read a few things from the Belkin report, which Michael issued last night, just to provide some context. Just some headlines. Michael's Belkin report, and, and I just want to say up front, I urge, you know, I read it every week. I have no commercial relationship with Michael, but he's been right as rain, and, you know, he's always looking for new subscribers. So I, I think it's tremendous value, especially the Belkin Light report. And so reach out to Michael uh, or his, uh, his marketing uh, representative. I just want to read to you a few clips from... Uh, the Belkin report from last night, Wall Street Journal, April 29, tech route drags NASDAQ to worst month, worst month since 2008. Yahoo Finance, April 30. Why Wall Street is saying, saying super bullish on Amazon despite stock crash. Bloomberg, April 29. Apple expects supply shortages to slash sales by $8 billion. Coined this April 28. Mark Zuckerberg to investors. Expect nothing from the metaverse. And on and on it goes. I guess the last one I'll say. Fox Business April 28. U.S. economy on brink of major recession. Deutsche Bank warns. So you read this. And I read this and I ask myself. Why is the market not down a lot more? I guess I got I'm impatient. I got to wait. But like. And I raised this question, I think, in the space the other day, as well as at the CMT conference last week. And my good friend John Roke is in the audience, the chart life in the second row, for those of you that don't know him. And I struggle, I struggle to come up with a plausible bull case. I didn't say come up with a bull case. Not one of these Byron Ween, you know, it's got one in a million chance like it could happen. But like, what's likely to happen? And rising yields rising dollar, rising interest rates. For those of you that were around uh, back in the 80s, Michael Belkin was, a few others who were as well. In the 80s in Japan, we had what was known as a triple merit scenario. We had falling oil prices, falling interest rates, and a falling dollar. Falling dollar was positive because it kept capital flows bottled up in Japan. And that gave us this huge, liquidity-driven blow-off bull market. Well, now in the United States, we've got the opposite markets globally. We have rising oil prices, rising interest rates, and a rising dollar. That's like kryptonite for financial assets. So you have the Fed raising rates. Inflation, which, you know, everyone has their opinion. Like, why would you believe the people who say it's peaking? These are the people who told you a year ago it was transitory. Small little detail, owner's equivalent rent, which is 30% of the CPI. They have down as only having gone up 5% over the last 20, 20, 12 months. When the facts are not the opinion, the fact is it went up 25%. So if you just made that delta, 20% increase on 30% of the CPI, the number will be 14%, not 8 But I digress. Rates are going up, I believe, short of a recession and continue to go up. My view, and do your own work, either... They don't do enough. They whiff. They just continue to engage in open mouth operations. Policy is still highly stimulative. They don't come anywhere close to jacking up rates sufficiently to kill the economy. And inflation just continues to cycle up on the road to Weimar. On the other hand, if Jerome Powell does this, we discover his Interpol Volcker, and they do get the bit between the teeth, and they do jack up rates we get a recession. So heads, you lose, tails, you don't win. In one direction, I see higher inflation interest rates. In the other direction, I see recession. Either way, Goldilocks is dead. 
Tina is dead. FOMO is dead. And there's a long way down. Enough of my rant. My good friend Michael Belkin, and I tweeted this out, he made the call in December. He's not one of these Johnny-come-latelys who just piled on and, you know, is now telling you we're in bear market territory because CNB says so, says so. He made the call in December. He was right for the right reasons. Here we are, May 3rd. And most remarkably, he went out, and I don't know how Michael does this stuff, but he'll have to explain his secret sauce a little bit. It's not voodoo. He's got this crazy statistical Fourier analysis stuff. He's a serious guy. He's a Cal Berkeley statistics grad. He's like, you got to short the FANG stocks. This is like two or three weeks ago. That was in the Belkin report. I'm like, really? Like, okay, Captain Kathy Wood's fine. The FANG stocks? Come on. That's been ground zero for the karma in the last couple of weeks. Hey, 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 John. Good to see you again. Long time, my friend. Um, while we're waiting for Michael to come up, uh, maybe just kind of updated thoughts. You, you've had a really good call on the market. Uh, what are you thinking, John? Um, I think still think we're in a bear market. Um, I think it's slow. Uh, we broke kind of the Mendoza line of 4,200 on the S&P 500. And if uh, you're a baseball fan from way back, you'll know that Mario Mendoza was a very light hitting uh, infielder for nine years in the majors. And I think five of those nine years, he hit less than 200, which is known as the Mendoza line. It's kind of a mark of futility uh, for major league players to hit below 200. Um, so we're below 4,200 uh, on the S&P, which is the equivalent of 200 for the major league hitter. And it's hard for me to get more encouraged without the S&P to go lower. I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, big cap financials have acted poorly. Big cap tech has acted poorly. And uh, we have not been able to rally on any good news, and we have not been able to shrug off any bad news. And George, as you mentioned earlier, the dollar's very strong, and rates kind of got to my target of 3% across the curve from 2s through 30s. I was just going through 12 um, global yields using 10 years as my proxy. 10 of 12 countries uh, have yields above their 2018 peaks. The only two countries that don't have them above 2018 peaks are Italy and the U.S. And the U.S. is right there with the 3% figure. Um, but uh, you could Switzerland, Switzerland's yield is at its highest level since uh, April of 2014. Sweden at its highest level since June of 2014. Uh, Australia at its highest level, I think, since October of 2014. So there are many yields around the globe using 10 years proxy that are higher than ours on a relative basis. I just think it's a matter of time before we get through this 3% target that I've had. And I think equities are going to continue to be challenged. John, um, what do you make of the daily price action where it seems like every rally gets sold? Does that speak to you? Well, it seems like Dikembe Mutombo or Hakeem Olajuwon are right there to kind of, you know, swat it back in your face. And I, when last I counted, I think there were eight intraday rallies today for the Dow of at least 50 basis points. I think it's your algo trading with my algo. And um, I don't think there's enough demand here. And I think that the, uh, the selling area is the equivalent of 4,200 on the S&P. Um, and I think that's uh, where we're going to continue to be uh, run into trouble. And maybe the S&P can stage a rally and get to near 4,300. But I think it'll be a sale there, too. And John, everything's risk reward. Um, I know you're a big friend of the space, is a big friend of mine. But just if you could repeat for the viewers, maybe your updated view on when, when not if, but when the trap door opens. What do you think the downside is? Let's just speak in terms of soundbite indices, whether it's Nasdaq or the S and P. So I think Nasdaq has risk to about ten thousand. My thesis has been that most items will get back down to their post-COVID breakout level. Uh, so let's call it ten thousand, uh, roughly. Uh, on NASDAQ and let's call it, you know, 3,600 was my first target on the S&P, but uh, it's probably a little bit lower for the, uh, for the breakout post COVID. Let's call it around 3,400, 3,450, somewhere in there. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, however, if those figures are kind of um, becoming a little bit too popular. Now I'm not trying to be an extra special wise guy here by saying that, but uh, I've seen a few people come out with those numbers, not that they're copying and I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm just saying that everybody's kind of that I've seen of late is kind of coalescing on the downside to those levels, which might suggest to me that they're going to be um, a little bit too 
let's say, uh, ambitious with respect to being able to hold there. Maybe in order to break this, you got to get below those levels. But that's just something I was thinking about today. I don't have any real basis for saying it other than I'm trying to be uh, observant of what others uh, are looking for and just trying to see, you know, as um, as as uh, something that, you know, we, we've heard over our careers, it's unlikely that most will be right. So I'm trying to figure out where I could be wrong. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. Michael Belk. Dr. Michael Dr. Belker. Michael Belker. Are, you, are you back are now? Are you back now? Hi, can you hear me now? You're perfect, You're Michael. perfect, Go Michael. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, sorry about that. Technologically challenged here on the West Coast. Um, so, uh, great introduction. Um, let me just, like, kind of set the stage and say, like, how, where are we, and how did we get here? So, um, after COVID, the U.S. government added five trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus and the federal reserve added 4.5 trillion of monetary stimulus that's how much its balance sheet expanded <clears throat> so now you hear you see these um uh little quotes from brokers out there saying well when the fed starts raising interest rates the stock market usually goes up until the third interest rate high. you know you've seen those stories out there okay no <laughs> this is this is an entirely different situation. The, the amount of stimulus that they pumped into here, into the system, is, was so ginormous that there's really nothing to compare to. Like, I, it's always dangerous to say this time is different, but it's different fundamentally because of the amount of stimulus that they pumped in. Okay, so that's over. It's over and out. No more fiscal stimulus. I mean, there's a little bit dribs and drabs. The states are doing things. The Fed is finished QE, and it's about to announce QT, quantitative tightening. So um, now they've, they have, as you alluded, George, they've, you know, open mouth operations. They've been talking this up for, you know, for weeks and months. You know, they've been preparing everybody. And the forward interest rate markets have actually adjusted. So a lot of this is, is reflected out in the uh, futures markets, you know, out distant maturities and stuff. Your dollar futures have declined a lot and et cetera. So there's a difference between the cash market and the futures market. But anyways, just to, you got to keep that in mind that saying we're coming out of a, a stimulus bubble, pure and simple. It's not, uh, it's not a conspiracy theory. They created a bubble, a stimulus bubble. And they always do this. I mean, first there was, you know, the, T, the Y2K bubble in 1999. They drove the market up, peaked in March 2000, and then went down for two years after that. Um, and there was a great op there was a great rotation opportunity there where you could um, short tech and buy defensive stocks. Um, but uh, also, so then they created the housing bubble with extra stimulus, you know, 2007, 2006, and that peaked in 2007, and then the market went down. You know, both times the S&P down went 50% in those down cycles. So uh, you put that together, that fundamental view with my... Now, what I do is forecasting, and I have a forecast model that gives direction, position, and intensity. And it's, it's similar mathematics to Fourier analysis and Box Jenkins, which I studied at UC Berkeley Business School and the stat department. And so I'm looking at a forward forecast. I'm looking for changes. My model's always looking for, say, so remember, direction, up, down, position, beginning, middle, end, and intensity or confidence interval. So I'm looking for new signals, strongest signals, um, and how long they're going to last. And you, you can sort of see where you are in the cycle. Um, if something is already taking place. So uh, bottom line is my long-term model on stock, global stock indexes, uh, as you put up on the, on the Twitter feed that from December, it turned down last year, November, December. And um, the, so direction down, intensity strong, uh, position just starting. Intensity as strong as it gets. So this is, to me, in my work, this is clearly a cyclical cycle top just like October 2007 or March 2000. You know, the, those were the last two. So this is like that, except kind of on steroids because they, they pumped in so much extra stimulus. So you keep that in mind. I mean, the market, if you want to be go from point A to point B, you should have sold everything, you know, back you know, November, December. And just if you want to be out of the market until it hits the bottom. And believe me, I want to be bullish, okay? You know, I'm not a, like a perma bear, but I'm... I, what I do is based on statistics and probability. And the probability says this thing's going to go down. People ask me, well, what would change your model forecast? And I'd say, like, when it looks this strong long-term, it's very, very 
almost it's very very unlikely almost impossible for the forecast to change that doesn't mean you so of course last time i came on i was bearish and the market immediately went up you know like 10 percent or something so it doesn't it doesn't mean you can't have these snapback rallies but the point is though that rally completely reversed so um let me just tell you what happened there um so so the s p went up let me see um from it peaked on March 29th, went up about 12% and completely reversed. And now we're back all the way back at the lows. So um, uh, what do you do? You sell rallies. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think how I can help people. But like most of my clients are family offices, billionaire family offices, et cetera, uh, hedge funds, medium, large, small hedge funds, big um, institutional long only asset managers that run huge portfolios, you know, in Europe and East Coast. And um, so everybody has sort of a different mandate and you can do what you can do only within your mandate. So if you're one of these long only guys um, or gals, I think um, basically, basically you should cut long exposure in the stock market down to the bare minimum that your mandate allows and um, shift out of tech consumer discretionary, communication services, and financials. Those sectors have a, ma a major underperformed forecast. Tech, consumer discretionary, communication services, and financials. I think you could lose a lot more money by being long those stocks than you can. Uh, and so what do you do? The, I'm speaking to the long only folks now, right? So people that can't really be short the market. So what do you do if you sell, if you shift, you know, reduce your, um, your, waiting in those sectors what you do is shift into consumer staples utilities REITs and healthcare and um lo and behold uh i don't think that those sectors are going to go up a whole bunch okay so i run everything relative and absolute so my my uh discipline consists of I still work Solomon Brothers hours. You know, I started back at Solomon Brothers in the 80s and uh, mid 80s and uh, started the Belkin Report in 1992. Um, but basically, you, you know, the, the, the best looking sectors in the market from a relative perspective are chicken longs. Um, household, and when you drill down to a group level, so of course there's sectors and then groups below sectors. I get things like household products, Kimberly Clark, beverages, you know, boring. I mean, these are not go-go momentum stocks by any stretch of the imagination. Personal products, Procter & Gamble, REITs, pharmaceuticals, Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, multi-utilities, you know, um, ETR, EVRG, things like that. And then energy. Now, energy, last time I was on, uh, I, I was... Uh, really positive on energy. I, energy, remember direction, position, intensity is what I do. So um, that's what the model gives. The intermediate term forecast for energy is getting long in the tooth. So energy to me is a hold. Energy stocks, you know, Exxon Mobil and energy, um, things, uh, energy service, things like that. Um, not so excited about energy anymore. It's it's still there as a long. I I wouldn't go short energy by any stretch of the imagination. And the long term signal is still there up. So I think energy will continue to surprise on the upside eventually. But intermediate term could be a little bit of a pullback at some point. Um, I would like to mention, if you're a fan of energy stocks, um, the best looking thing right now is uh, MLP multi limited partnerships pipelines. So there's a there's a uh, ETF, AMLP, that's the sim symbol of it, M Andrew, Michael, Larry, pa Paul. And it has an 8% dividend yield. Insane. Like, what else can you, where else can you get an 8% dividend yield? So if you like energy, um, that, uh, and by the way, that has an outperform, fresh outperform forecast versus the energy sector. So it's sort of a defensive energy play, but you've got, it gives you some room on the downside you know, with a, with a big um, uh, dividend yield like that. So, um, and just to kind of wrap up this thought, um, now, if you're not a long only fund, if you can short, um, you know, I would just say short the market on bounces. You know, you get these big bounces, you know, a couple, three days, 
turn around and short the queues. You know, there's all kinds of ways to short the market. In my report, I give individual stocks that are shorts. Um, I, I don't want to get into that too heavily right here, but um, there's a great long short uh, trade setting up. And that would be short tech, long defensive. So nice market neutral thing. It's an alpha capture. I do this. Some of my clients are alpha capture funds. I'm a contributor, and I was I was number one in a in last quarter, in uh, in the alpha capture fund client. They have 170 or so contributors, including sell side bulge bracket funds like Goldman, and, as well as independent research guys like me. And um, so, and it's all completely market neutral. It's not. It, it has nothing to do with market goes up or goes down. It doesn't affect. It just has to do with what your longs, do your longs outperform the market and do your shorts underperform the market? So I think um, moral of the story, if you can do things like that and you can get your head around, you know, pair trades, which is the original hedge fund idea, right? You're supposed to be uh, long stocks that go up and short stocks that go down. So um, a way to do that with ETFs is long XL. So the things that the, the ETFs that want to outperform are staples, that's XLP, utilities, that's XLU, um, real estate, that's XLRE, and energy, XLE, and healthcare, XLV. So those five want to outperform. And you can kind of pick and mix and match between those and then be short tech, consumer discretionary, communication services, and financials. And those are XLK is tech, XLY is consumer discretionary, XLC is communication services, that's Facebook, things like that. And, um, uh, and then XLF is financials. And just to give you an idea of what's happened, I, I just kind of fleshed this out before I came on here. Um, okay, let me just tell you what's happened to flesh this idea out. So Netflix peaked last October, it's down 70%, 70%. Facebook, like, and get that, October. Uh, September, Facebook, down 44%. Amazon, July, down 33%. This is with the S&P down 10%, right? Or it's down 12. As of today, the S&P is down 12. So these, these FANG stocks, my, my report last week was called Fang, it's up there on the on the Twitter feed. Fang from the penthouse to the outhouse. So um, Apple is only down as much as the S and P. Apple's down twelve percent. Microsoft is down eighteen percent. Um, Google, whatever the alphabets now it's called, down twenty one percent. Peak last November. Tesla, peak last November, down twenty six percent. Nvidia. Peaked last November, down 41%. AMD peaked last November, down 41%. So what I'm saying is there's great, uh, there's great um, opportunities on the short side in the market. And these, were n these are non-consensus shorts. These have been at the top of my sell list and short list you know, for months and months. So it's worked. Um, they still probably have a lot of downside. I have other stocks that, you know, that are more fresh ideas than that. But FANG is still a major short for me. There's an ETF. There's some ETFs on, for FANG. You can suss that out. Um, semiconductors, really vulnerable. So that's uh, as NVIDIA, AMD, Micron, Marvel, MRVL, things like that. Shorts, major shorts. Computers, uh, you know, Dell, things like that, storage technology that's in that group, communication equipment, Juniper, uh, software. Now, those have been clobbered. It's further along member direction, position intensity. Position is not early for software, that's for sure, but a lot of those stocks have a lot more downside. Um, MSCI is a, it, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, securities brokers, these are shorts. Uh, Schwab, RJF, Morgan Stanley. God bless them. You know, they're bearish on the market, but their stock is a short. Um, money Center Banks, uh, Bank of America, JP Morgan. These are all already down like 15, 20% with the S&P down 12. So what I'm saying is there's an opportunity on the short side. There's an opportunity in market neutral spreads where you short things that are going down more than the market. And then you have longs that are going to outperform the market. So you can just have no market exposure, sleep at night, and not be too volatile 
and make money in a bear market. So I'm kind of throwing out ideas there about how you can make money in a bear market. And I've got some other ideas about what's coming up, but let's, George, let's, uh, right. why don't right. you get, get on, jump in here and, uh, you know, carry away with some questions and guidance here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, um, I so I actually just wanted, actually to, just wanted to, to hear your views, hear your on, views bonds on bonds as well. Because you've touched, because on, the you've touched on the equity side and the, the subsectors. Sub but what do you think, about, what do you the think about the bonds and the dollar, dollar here, here as well? Hey, good question. Uh, that was exactly what I wanted to start talking about. Okay, so um, I was short, the model was short bonds for a long time, you know. So um, the bond, the TLT T bond ETF, long bond ETF, peaked on August 4th, 2020. That's 18 months ago. And it's down um, 30% since then. Um, it, with a few zigs and zags, uh, it, it, more recently, it's down 24% since December 21st. So that's like five months. In the last five months, it's down 24%. And what I'd like to compare that to is 1987. So 1987 is when I started my career. I, I, was, I was one year into my career at Solomon Brothers. So just to take a step back, I, I came out of the UC Berkeley Business School. I was recruited by, uh, I was flown back to New York by First Boston, Larry Fink, who's now head of BlackRock, of course. He was just a bond, a mortgage bond trader at First Boston in those days. Um, I managed, uh, I, I had an interview also with Laszlo Barini at Solomon Brothers, and he hired me on the spot. So I went, I, and actually, funny thing is Larry Fink ended up blowing up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no offense, but he, he had uh, his mortgage bond position when it blew up. And so it wouldn't have been a good, good place to go anyways. He ended up leaving First Boston not long after that, I believe. So um, anyways, I'd been at Solomon, to get back to the point, for about a year in 1987. And I remember that the bonds sold off. So Greenspan came in, he was a new Fed chairman, started raising interest rates, and the bonds sold off by 24%. The same exact thing that's happened this year since December 21st. So in the, the, the 30-year T-bond fell by 24% from March 4th, 1987 to October 19th, 1987. And got that date, October 19th. So bonds collapsed until the day of the crash. And then there was a huge bond market rally. And they, did, they went down 24% in... What's that, like five months? So what we've had now is a very similar thing. And I've been waiting. So I'm looking forward to, I'm, I'm looking at the forward forecast for bonds. And I see the potential for a panic, just like in 1987, a panic asset allocation shift out of stocks into bonds. Now, we're not there yet. So don't go out and go buy don't go out and, you know, issue a buy order for TLT, you know, right now. <laughs> you need to wait. I remember what I do is look at forecasts and I can see these things approaching. It's a little bit like being in a boat approaching the dock and, you know, you're still maybe a quarter mile away. You don't want to step off the boat into the water until you get to the boat, to the dock, right? So that's how these forecasts, you can see these things approaching and you just want to wait till you get to the dock. So, but I see it approaching and um, just to put that in perspective, we could be setting up like 1987 and never nothing's ever exactly like anything else. Don't get me wrong. I hate overlaying one chart with another chart and expecting the same exact thing to happen. But um, we have a, a similar situation where they're withdrawing stimulus. The stock market is just pregnant with speculation. Um, every, you know, where's in where sentiment might be getting uh, somewhat bearish um, it's not anything compared to what could happen where there's panic selling. So margin debt is, is, uh, is declining. So we could be approaching a major inflection point where asset allocation funds, and just to put, flesh that out a little idea, we had, I can talk about this now because they're not, I'm not working for the sell side. You know, I worked for the sell side, I know what you have to do. So we had a major pension fund client. It was General Motors, basically. And um, I knew the guy who ran, ran it. You know, he was a friend and a, 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 we, we had a pretty good relationship back then. But th they basically sold all their stocks and go, going into the, up to the 87 crash. And it paralyzed, our trading floor was like completely con con convulsed. You know, I mean, he dumped such a huge portfolio. We, we weren't getting 
you know, execution orders back. Nobody knew what was going on. It was just a mess. You know, if you remember, if you were back in the market in 87, the volatility was just so high. And everything, there were, it was before the, uh, you know, computerized trading. There were dot machines and stuff, but it, was, it wasn't the same as today. Anyways, um, there was this huge shift out of stocks into bonds. And uh, Tudor Jones, uh, believe it or not, he made more money, I've heard him say this, being long bonds in the crash than he did being short stocks. He said that. That's a quote from him. And he, he's on the tape today saying he wouldn't touch bonds or stocks. He's so bearish. I think he might have forgotten or he's not, you know, he hasn't seen, he doesn't see the similarities between now and then. But I do. So long story short, I, I, would, be sh I would be hesitant to be short bonds at this point. I'm looking for a bottom in bonds, a panic out of stocks, major asset allocation trade where some huge institution pulls the plug on their, on their equity market exposure, shifts it all into government bonds, and you get this major cataclysmic convulsion, high volatility move uh, where stocks crash and bonds go up big. Michael, this, Michael, this, Michael, hold, Michael, on, Michael hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. All right, hold on. You know what the problem is? Michael, mute, mute yourself, please. Stay muted. Okay. I th I Michael, that, Michael, Michael, stay, please mute yourself. Mute your mic, please. The technological glitch we're having here appears to be, is Michael, when you're unmuted and anyone else talks, it creates a huge echo. So it was echoing when I was talking. It was echoing when Shrub was talking. So the, the trick, Michael, please, is when you're not talking, please mute your mic because otherwise the room is going to be dysfunctional. Um Okay, so Shrub, did you uh, want to have a response to Michael or any thoughts you wanted to share? With yeah, ju just two thoughts, actually. Just on the, the similarity between 87 and this one, um, uh, you know, I put the charts in there of previous bear market tops. They, every time they break this 30-week moving average that uh, Stan Weinstein was talking about, and the same thing happened here. And it usually happens when people are really long, levered long, and suddenly you have the technical break, and it just keeps going down. So that's one similarity as well. Um, the second interesting aspect, what you said about the bonds uh, versus equities, um, we've been having much more outflows in bonds all year versus equities. We haven't had many outflows. So maybe what you're saying does make sense for an 87 type response that if there is an equity crash and people are actually underweight bonds, maybe we could have a bond rally as well. That's kind of my two cents based on yeah, your experience. Shrub, Shrub, I would just say, I mean, you've been you've been ace on these uh, flow things. I just find it remarkable. I mean, if memory serves me correct, with like nineteen, twenty billion a couple of weeks ago, then thirteen billion, then a billion. We've only had like what thirty, thirty-five billion of ad flows, and that's after a trillion plus of inflows. I mean, doesn't it seem like the ice? I mean, it, this could break. It wouldn't take much. I mean, doesn't it seem very dangerous to you, Shrub? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the door is uh, becoming smaller. And I think one very, very important milestone happened today when Tiger Global reported uh, down 44% on the year. Um, so you can tell that these big boys are hurting. And if they're hurting that much, it means the smaller guys are, must be blowing up as well. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think we're probably at the stage where tech investors are praying for a, for a bounce, but it could be a protracted... Uh, uh, tech bear market because until you get all those outflows out, it's going to take a while. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And and again, I mean, Shrub, you I still remember the conversations a couple of Saturdays ago or whatever. You and I were almost laughing. We we're talking about the bond market and whatever. I just think I, I really struggle to come up with a bull case for the market. And look, there's no guarantees in life. Everything is risk reward. And and, and so let me put that into a question, Michael. You know, life is not linear. You have to. As they say, trade the market you have, not the one you want. And the opportunity set varies. Sometimes the ball is as big as a grapefruit and you want to swing it like really hard because it's a really high conviction setup. It could be wrong. And then there are times when, yeah, it looks okay, but you don't want to bet so much. So it's clear you're negative. We got that. But on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being most conviction, 1 being least conviction, in your career, having seen these, knowing the way the models work, cycles work, is your conviction level a 10 or a 1 or somewhere in the middle, Michael? Nine. <laughs> so I'd say, yeah, that, the number that springs to mind is nine, 90%. And so it's as well as the bonds almost setting up, not quite. Remember, like we're, I see something coming. It's not like technical analysis where the chart ends today. 
I'm looking, I'm always looking at a forecast. Now, the other thing that feeds into this that we haven't talked about yet is volatility. So the forecast for volatility goes up. And if you're not, I mean, if you've lived through bear markets, you, you, you understand this, that the percentage bands expand. So the daily, if you plot daily percentage changes of a stock index in a bull market, it would be kind of a small horizontal range, you know, up half percent, maybe a big move is 1% up or down. Most of the time, it just kind of inches up on low, low percentage changes. Um, in a bear market, the band expands like a megaphone. So you get big, you get 3% up days, 5% down days, 2% up days, down, then, then down three, down four, down seven, then up six. So you get these crazy market swings and it's very difficult to keep your bearings. It's almost like being, I live on Puget Sound out here outside of Seattle and I, we, we've gone north in our boat into uh, Canada and we tried crossing the, the straits, um, straits of Juan de Fuca one time and the, it was just a bad decision. The waves were like, you know, super high. The boat was going up to now. <laughs> My kids were crying, I want to go home, I'm going to die. So anyway, that's how, it, that reminds me of these swings in the market where it's, it's difficult to keep your bearings because when it goes down, like say you get a 3% down day, 4% down day, you say, oh God, it's the end of the world. I got a short, sell everything short in the hole. Then it bounces up in your face, up 5% the next day, and then up 2% after that. And then you go, oh God, I got to cover my shorts. Now, oh, it's over. Oh, finally the market's bottomed. Now I can go long again. And then it goes down 7% the next day. So it's, it's, if you're just paying attention to the short-term high volatility swings, you're going to get leveled. So you have to like do the opposite of what, um, what comes naturally to me is to be bearish at the bottom and bullish at the top. I mean, just emotionally as a human being, I, I don't know if everybody else, else is like that, but as a contrarian, you should be, when you feel like saying, um, you know, it's up two days in a row, oh good, it's bottomed. That's the time to go short, put out the shorts. So back to the confidence level, yeah, I, yeah I'd say like short rallies, big time. And the VIX is like the key to this. Okay. So long-term forecast for the VIX is up and it hasn't moved that much yet. It's kind of at the top of the range where it's been over the last year or so, but this, that ain't nothing yet. I mean, if we get, uh, you know, a major high volatility sell-off, the VIX is going to soar the VXX, which is a terrible thing to be long, but it's going to go up double or triple. Um, but an option volatilities which are still, well, they're getting on the expensive side now. They were very cheap a while back. They're going to be completely unaffordable. So options will be, um, you know, they'll be very difficult to trade. But the point is, you got to steal yourself in a bear market for volatility. It's just really, really difficult. And like last time, you know, I came on, I was bearish, the market went up. I got, you know, people complain, oh, you're wrong. You know, the market goes up. And here we are back at, a, you know, we're below the level of there. So the right thing to do was to short heavily into rallies. Real simple, so simple kind of thing to remember. Bull market, buy the dips. Bear market, short the rallies. Michael, that's Michael, great. that's great. So question, uh, and this is actually a good catch. Someone uh, writes to me, last time Michael said his model showed big downside would be happening around the May timeframe. Can you follow up on that for me? Thanks. So, yeah, I seen your call that you're right, because you were like, don't shorten the hole, yada, yada. May, it looks like it's setting up. So my question, I guess, is, and again, roadmaps are not infallible, but the idea that you thought May would be a time for big down, is that still the way it looks to you? Absolutely, yeah. So we brought, we are, if you look at a chart of the indexes, they're all back to their lows, right around their lows. NASDAQ's a little bit lower from the the, the March lows. Um the Russell 2000 is broken significantly below its March lows. And a lot of these stocks I mentioned, they're way below, you know, so like the, the generals, Amazon, Facebook, all these kind of things, uh, NVIDIA, AMD, they're, they're leading the market lower. Yeah. So um, I think there's the high probability of a high volatility market collapse. And again, I, I would, I would love to be bullish. Okay. <laughs> I love, I love when things, you know, setting up for a rally. It's just not setting up for that right now. It's it is setting up for a major decline. Like you said, there's only been 35 billion or so of outflows. Um, the uh, the margin debt has been decreasing for about four or five months now. 
And um, uh, uh, your, the other speaker mentioned uh, Tiger Global. So they're down 44, 45% on the year after being down 7% yet last year. So they're down, you know, they've lost 50% on $100 billion if that's, you know, they ran $100 billion at the end of the year. Um, so the question becomes, what happens to funds that are down that much and who don't do anything about it? And I'm not trying to pick on them. You know, it's no fun being, you know, being down. It, and don't get me wrong. I, I hate picking on people in the hole. It's a, it's a horrible thing to do. But you just have to be objective about this. Brokers start blowing out positions for hedge funds when they're down big because they're worried about getting paid back. So if they're still running a leveraged book. And, of course, Tiger Global is probably just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, of course, it's a big tip, you know, $100 billion, There's not that many hedge funds like that. But um, anybody else that's kind of following in their footsteps, and of course, the hedge fund mafia, as I call them, um, they go, they have breakfast meetings together, they're in the same stocks, they all have the, this group think, you know, and uh, not everyone, but there's a core group of hedge funds that probably have the same sort of positions. Uh, um, so what I would say to look for a, a sign of a market bottom would be... Um, complete liquidation of, say, some of these hedge funds that are down big. They just either voluntarily, they just say, I'm giving up, you know, I'm closing everything down. Or, you know, Goldman Morgan pulls the plug on them and they just blow out. And that's where you get stocks. If you haven't lived through this movie before, when a, when a broker starts blowing out your stocks, they don't wait for like a better price, you know. It's like out at whatever the market, whatever the bid is, hit it with you know you know millions of shares at a time that's when you get this cascading down phenomena and that can so i i my ideal scenario would be we get something like that in the next month really trades off get a major major decline gets down the 200 week average for the nasdaq is down about 18 percent from here so i and by the way the um a lot of stocks are already below that level, so it's not like that's unreachable or conspiracy theory or something. Um, you know, Amazon, Facebook, they're way below that level. Uh, and the European indexes hit the 200-week averages and bounced just precisely. DAX, FTSE mid-cap. So 200-week um, average is a good thing to keep an eye on. So I would, I would say down – I mean, it's not a precise level. This isn't brain surgery, but you can get – down there around the 200-week average, say down 20% on the NASDAQ over the course of this month. Complete blowout. It looks like the end of the world. That would set the stage for an intermediate-term rally, a sustainable bear market rally, which I don't think we've had yet. So that rally in March, you know, was up 10%. To me, that was nothing. You know, that's like the kind of one you want to sell and shell and short into aggressively. Um, a, a more bear markets can be very tricky, and you don't want to stay short through a 30 or 40 percent rally, right? And of course, you can have a 30 or 40 percent rally when things go down 40 percent. You can have a 40 or 50 percent. A 30 percent rally is just a partial recovery. But that's what you want to look out for if you're short. So um, I don't want to get too cute here and too precise, and nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. But my ideal scenario would be I, I have a high confidence we're headed down soon this month. NASDAQ should reach its 200-week average. There's signs of distress. Um, you know, major asset allocation shift out of stocks into bonds, stocks crash, looks like the end of the world, outflows all over the place. That might be um, set the stage. Not yet. I'm looking out. We're certainly not there yet. Don't get me wrong. Maybe out in four to six weeks sometime. Then perhaps we get a sustainable bear market rally recovery that lasts for a few months into the summer. That again, that might be a little bit too cute, but that's that's the general thing I'm looking for. Thank you, Michael. First, we're going to go to Michael Kantrowitz, and then followed by Mark Newman, followed by Deer Point. Michael, good to see you, my friend. Mike, Michael Kantrowitz, what, hello to Michael Belkin. Michael Kantrowitz, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, and uh, nice to meet you, Michael. Um, heard a lot of great things about you from George, and glad uh, you're here today. Uh, so I had a two-part question, I guess. Um, you said your conviction's a 9 out of 10. I'm curious, you know, you always kind of want to ask yourself, where could I be wrong? Or what is there something you have in mind that's not making it a 10 out of 10 besides just, you know, there's no guarantees? And then the second one, if this plays out as, you, as you know, generally you're, you're forecasting, what, what do you think the catalyst is for a, a bottom in the market? 
Uh, and then lastly, I guess it's a three-part question. If you could kind of give us any color on what's driving the forecast to the extent, you know, not giving away the secret sauce, but just uh, just to give us an idea of, you know, what are the metrics you're looking at? Is it fundamental? Is it technical? Is it policy? Is it all of it or something else? Thanks. Okay, nine out of 10. Well, that's 90% probability. Uh, that's, I <laughs> don't get much higher than that in my world. Um, and in terms of what makes the model work, okay, so you say, uh, what could change? Uh, you know, what, how could I be wrong? That's always a good thing to keep in mind because you don't want to be, you know, cast in concrete and be dragged out, you know, in a sarcophagus. Sarcoph um, it would, it, as I mentioned before, it's the long-term signal that's down. So I'm, the long-term signal is using monthly data. So I, what my model does is it has a 12-period forward forecast using monthly data that's 12, next 12 months, so next year. So the model says the next year, at least, is going to be down with no turning point in sight. And based, I, you know, this is as strong as it gets. That's all I can say. I don't, it, it, this only compares to, to, you know, late 2007 down or uh, early 2000 down or up 2002 or up, 2009 march so these long-term signals they they don't there's they set up infrequently and when they do set up i've just learned to pay attention to them you know so and it's you, you don't want to get too cute and try to you know trade again yeah it's down but it could bounce up you know well, that was like my former boss stanley shopcorn <laughs> just would give you an idea he was head of equities at um at solomon brothers and um I, I was uh, I started out in market analysis with Laszlo Barini. I ended up I was a quant, so I was a resource person for a lot of different people at Solomon, including Kaufman, Bob Solomon. Um, I wasn't really part of their unit, but I would be kind of drafted in to do research pro uh, publications for them to you know to flesh out the quantitative side of it. Um, Rob Arnott was another guy I worked with at Solomon. Anyways, last couple of years I was there, I developed this model and I, and I came in at the end of 1989, beginning of 1990. And I said, Stanley, I pounded on the conference room table, wooden table. Nas, the, the Nikkei is going down. George knows me from those days. I was saying, this is it. It's over. George started this out, you know, this presentation with talking about the, the three merits of Japan, how everything was was fantastic. And then it all came unglued. So this is also comparable to that. And that, um, just to get back to the point, uh, I, I was, I faced opposition all the way down. So the short term, Stanley and the other, there were two other traders in there and, and they were, um, th we were running the uh, equity macro proprietary trading on the equity side of Solomon Brothers. Same thing Meriwether was doing on the bond side. We were doing on the equity side with less capital because it was more of a bond house than the equity house. But I remember getting just getting pushback all the time. It was Stanley, well, it's gone down so much. I don't want to take some profits and then put them on. It's going gonna, it's gonna to rally out. And the other traders, well, it's going to, how do we know it's going down? It's going to, so I was, kind of, and I, I just look at the model forecast. I said, come on, it's going down. Don't sell the rallies. Don't, don't cover them. Go to, it's going down. It's going down. So I have the same kind of, basically same sort of um, certainty probability level as I did back then. And uh, okay, what you asked about the model. So it turns out everything I do is based on rates of change. So I studied Fourier, the mathematics behind Fourier are scary. Like if you, you know, I was in the stat department at Cal and it was all, there were no other uh, business school people. I was in the business school. There were no business school people except for me. They were all physics and, and engineering people. So Fourier is a cyclical thing. It shows turning points. And um, my model is not exactly Fourier, but I learned the mathematics behind Fourier and also Box Jenkins ARIMA. So that's autoregressive integrated moving average. That's what the, um, the U.S. government uses to seasonally adjust all the economic data that you get. So I, I cut my teeth on that stuff, and I learned... I took the mathematics that I learned from studying those things and I developed my own model that's based on rates of change. So it turns out my aha moment back way back when, 30 something years ago, was rates of change are not random.
Simple as that. So I back tested everything uh, systematically. That's what I did. I was, I'm a quant. So if you follow a de decision rule, you know, uh, enter the trade, exit the trade. What are your percentage winning? You know, winning, winning trades, winning losses, and you end up with an expected value. So I, I basically back tested everything that I could find. You know, CT, what CTAs use, multi regression models. Uh, Box Jenkins for, for you know everything, and I came up with something that's better. That's all it was. It's not perfect. I wouldn't try to land the space shuttle SpaceX, you know, like coming back to the launch pad in a rocket or something. It's not that good. It's not 100 percent, but it's pretty darn good. It's better than anything else that's out there, and it gives you a forward look at things. So that's all I can say. Um, that's what I've I. I rely on my my whole business is based on this. I've been doing the same exact model since 1992. Nothing's changed. I optimized it way back when. And it's really useful on, on um, ratios. Okay, so n not just the market. So I've, I've been talking about the market, but um, it turns out if you take the ratio, say the ratio of energy sector to the S&P 500, you divide energy, you have a historical price series of each, then you divide the energy sector by the S&P 500, then you just have a relative uh, chart of so if it's going up energy stocks are outperforming if it's going down energy stocks are underperforming so it turns out when you do it that's just um you know that removes noise from the series so ratios are more stable that's another secret aha kind of thing i'm giving away for free here so if you i probably look at ratios in much much more detail than anybody else does I, i've never seen anybody i know i've seen other people's stuff but they they do relative charts but i'm looking at forecasts of ratios so to get back to the point, answering your question, when when the all the defensive stuff, like the monthly forecast for staples, utilities, real estate, healthcare, energy, and by the way, gold, gold and gold and gold stocks, long term up relative to the S and P, strong as it gets, ninety percent. And this, the opposite of that is the tech, consumer discretionary, all the stuff I said, communication services, financials, down. So when I have the direction of the market going down, and then I have um, support from the forecast for sectors where the, only the most defensive stuff is supposed to outperform. In other words, chicken longs. It's setting up for a major rotation out of high momentum stuff, which is already happening, obviously. But this is going to continue for the next year. So that that re really reinforces my certainty about this is a major, this is a major, major inflection point. I mean, we're way past it now. We're May. The inflection point was November. So the NASDAQ peaked November 19th. Um, it almost went to the same level. First day of the year, S&P peaked January 3rd, I believe. The NASDAQ almost got back. But all these other, all these other stocks, as you know, as you're, everybody's aware, have been declining big time underneath. So um, that's the story. Uh, the sector rotation, long-term forecast supports the market forecast. Um, in, in terms of major risk, get out of stocks, get into defensives. So, Michael K., um, I heard I was hearing some strategists the other day. He was talking about how defensive stocks, even though they're kind of expensive, like on a relative earnings basis and fundamentals, like they look set to outperform for quite a while, given we are in the business cycle and profit cycle. Like, do you did you hear that guy's story? What was he saying, Michael K.? Um, I agree with uh, certainly the rest of the year story, um, you know, over the next four to five weeks with, with, with that's why I was trying to I better understand what types of models and tools that he's looking at that's getting, getting him those signals. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly uh, an increasingly defensive tilt makes a lot of sense. So totally agree with that. Uh, valuation is useless for things, things like staples and utilities. Their relative performance lines up with market uh, risk metrics, which if we're all right you know, in terms of the direction we're talking about, those risk metrics like credit spreads are going to continue to widen. So, yeah, no, I'm definitely, I would say, very much in agreement. Um, I, I'm always curious to hear how others kind of get to their conclusions. Um, certainly sounds like we do things a, a little differently, but um, I'm, sure there's some, I'm sure there's some overlap. So I just, want to, I just want to reset the room. We're here with Michael Belk on the Belkin Report. Um, I've known Michael 30-some-odd years from his days at Solomon Brothers. He's had more than his fair share of ridiculous calls, uh, particularly calling crashes. I don't know anybody that does it better. I'm not trying to strike fear in people's hearts, but listen to Michael and understand what the guy, understand his track record. 
he's got credit in my view. Um, it's like that old, those old EF Hutton commercials when Michael Belkin speaks, I listen. So I think we all need to take heed to what Michael's saying. He ha- he's had this call now since the turn of the year, so he didn't just come on to this in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I have no commercial affiliation with Michael. However, I do want to mention that he does offer a stripped-down version of his work. Uh, if you go to at Hyperpron, that's at H-Y-P-E-R-P-O on at Hyperpron, um, they will take care of you. He's offering a, uh, he, again, his, his, his product is a, he offers a, a stripped-down version at a mere fraction of the cost of the institutional product. And for a limited time offer only, uh, he's offering a special discount. For anyone who's listening to this broadcast, 20% off. Anyone who wants to subscribe in the next couple of days, um, so please uh, go to at Hyperpron, H-Y-P-E-R-P-O-R-N. And if you're interested in subscribing, uh, they will help you there uh, at that Twitter sp- at that Twitter address. The other commercial thing I want to say, this room is unbelievable. You guys are unbelievable. Um, I see so many friends in here, people I, a lot of you I didn't know months ago, many of you I did. But you've really all, this has made a fantastic room. We've got something really special here. We have the best speakers, the best content, the best moderation, the smartest audience. We really have a community here, and it's just staggering. And you guys have been heard me plugging away for World Central Kitchen in the last few weeks. Many of you, most of you have given generously. I'm happy to report the other day for any of you guys that weren't in the room, it was completely electric what occurred on Saturday. Uh, we had a couple of tremendous leadership gifts. Uh, Alexander from Switzerland stepped up with a $50,000 challenge, a matching pledge. And that really put the thing into overdrive. I think we started Saturday with, I don't know, 63000 or something like that. And we raised, I don't know, 35000 in the room on uh, Saturday. And that doesn't include the matches from uh, Alexander. I think we're at 103 right now. You throw his matches in, you throw another 20 on 25 on top of that, or 22 on top of that, we're probably at 125. Anyway, that's all a long way of saying you guys are fantastic. Also, Alexander, like, I want to make this guy pay. I want you guys to help put the squeeze on him. He pledged 50,000 in a match so far. And Carol, if she comes up here, she can speak to the numbers and I'll tell you what's going on. But roughly speaking, um, I think so far we've, we've put up 22 against this pledge of 50. So if we can put up another 28, it's going to cost him 28. So 28 and 28 is 56. You add that on top of the 125 that we're at right now. We'll be over $180,000. I mean, think about that. Just think about that. This room was nothing a few months ago. And now, not only are we helping each other, we're doing really good work. I mean, we'll, we'll be at 200000 before no time. So the challenge, I challenge all of you together, to please, let's make Alexander pay. I mean, he, what what an inspiration! He put up fifty thousand. Jan Van Eck, uh, he jumped in with ten thousand to match. I mean, it's just phenomenal. So you guys are awesome. Please, please, please give generously. This is just this is. They're going to write stories about this room. I, I promise you. So, at any rate, enough of that. Um, my good friend Mark Newman. Um, Mark, how are you? Uh, the floor is yours. Mark Newman, the floor is yours. Hey George, how are you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I just want to say, Michael, um, your your calls on top of your humility is outstanding for you. This is what makes you amazingly good, I think, is you came on and you said, humbly, I called for a short and the market rallied the next day. But the tidbits in there that you said, like, be short Apple, and it was 175, that's the stuff that I remember. I barely remember you said, be short, and it went up. I remember you saying, short that big zero percent short interest stock and it, it it's the it's what keeps you uh at the top of your game i think really just um and and i just want to say thank you because it's super insightful and so refreshing to hear guys say i made an amazing call but actually i got it wrong which is just incredibly uh humble let's say now at the time you said about gold stocks and i heard you mention that very recently here uh just before and you also i heard your four to six week may May trouble, so to speak. Now, in that context, I would see stocks down, rush to bonds, yields go lower. So within the gold and dollar complex, how do you see it? Because there are a lot out there now. I think it was 
Larry Summers, love him or hate him, whatever. He sort of said, well, Bitcoin's an experiment. And if you want to hold a currency, dollar, yen or euro, it's going to be dollar. So I've contested with some people that the dollar and gold could go up here. And I wanted to see how that uh, juxtaposes with your model, Michael. OK, um, <clears throat> great question. Uh, so uh, the, the long term forecast is still up for gold and, and sort of the XAU gold stock index relative to the S&P. Next 12 months, it's one of the strongest places to be as, as a defensive thing. And um, you got to remember um, at the, the GDX is negatively correlated to the S&P 500. Now that changes, it's not real stable, it can change over time. But generally, it's one of the things that can go up when the market goes down. Now, having said that, my confidence is a little bit shaken. Uh, the, in, as you, I'm sure you're aware, the gold stocks have sold off over the last couple of weeks, and I, you know, I took it on the chin in that. Um, but they're still there in the forecast, so I, you know, it's still there. I, I think, uh, I, you know, I still like them. The long-term forecast is still there. I agree with you on the dollar and gold going up together. And let's talk about the dollar. Some, somebody else mentioned, I forgot to answer that question before. Okay, so the model's been long the dollar for a while. And um, so remember direction, position, intensity. So direction is up. Position, not early anymore um, it, for the DXY. Uh, it's still there, lo intermediate and long term. So I'm still long the dollar. Dollar is a hold for me. Now, if you drill down, what's happening, <clears throat> so that's, you know, euro, Swiss franc, British pound, things like that. Um, what's really interesting is the Chinese yuan. Okay, so the dollar up. I have a really strong early signal. It's now it's a few weeks, not so early, but it's um, it's been something I've been pushing in the report. Long dollar, short China won, as well as Japanese yen. Of course, the yen has gone from 120 to 130 or something, you know, dollar yen in a very brief amount of time. So um, I, I'm still long dollar yen, short yen, long dollar. Um, and that has obviously major implications for Japan. Remember, Japan has been in a, in a mess for forever no inflation, and they keep doing QE forever. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, Japan might have reached the end of the limits of mo modern monetary theory, you know. Um, so uh, Japan looks really perilous to me. Um, I think the yen could keep weaken weakening. Um, the Chinese yuan, now that is a really interesting one. Um, and here's something else I'd like to point out. Um, the 200-month Remember, I talked about 200-week, 200-month averages. So um, the S&P bottomed around its 200-month averages in the last two major down cycles. That would be 2002, 2009. Got down to the 200-month, which is way down there, 40%, 60%, something like way. So it's way down there. Um, but guess where, Chinese, guess where the Chinese stock market is? It's there. It's almost on the 200-month average. So preview of coming attractions. Um, China, currency weakens. It's a mess. Obviously, now they're putting cages. If you follow the news, they're putting cages around people in Shanghai. They can't green wire cages. You come out of your apartment in the morning, you can't leave because they put, uh, you know, the, the, so it looks like a total mess. But, you know, remember what Templeton said, you know, the, the, buy, the time to buy is the point of maximum pessimism. We're not there yet. Okay. And I'm still short China. I'm still short Hong Kong. But, I see a turning point of anything, if there's anything in the world that's gone down enough to where it might go contracyclical and rally. Um, it's kind of like when George, you know, <laughs> my first client was George Novo <laughs> when I left Solomon Brothers in 1992. And I was famous for calling, you know, I've told you the story about the Japanese stock market going down and getting that right. And I, I put out these little charts of the Nikkei with triangles and I had I put little pictures of Japanese guys jumping off the triangles, committing harikari, and I, I got a lot of bad feedback from that. Anyways, so I was famous for being um, negative on Japan and get, getting that right. So when I went up, I left Solomon at the beginning of 1992. I drive up to Boston to see George with my huge desktop PC. I mean, it was before the, I even had a laptop, and I'm carrying this thing up the up the you know ladder up the elevator to their office. And I give this presentation to George saying, the Nikkei, it's probably bottomed. It's probably going to go up. <laughs> you know? And if you look back, that was a, that was a, that's it bottomed. There was a major bottom in the Japanese market right around that time. So um, back to the point, 
Um, the dollar down, but China is interesting, not yet, but approaching. So that's something to put on your radar screen. Don't go out and buy Baidu or Baba or any of these stocks yet. They're still shorts for me. But again, I'm looking at a forecast. You know, remember, you're approaching the dock. You don't want to get off the boat, you know, when you're a quarter mile away and get in the water and drown. So that's kind of where we are with China. We're approaching the dock, but we're not there yet. Um, to it, one other thing I'd like to um, talk about is emerging markets. So dollar versus uh, dollar just reversed big time versus Latin American currencies. So I have dollar, Mexican peso, dollar, Brazil real, dollar, Colombian peso, dollar, Chilean peso, dollar, Peru, Sol, long. So long dollar, short um, Latin America. And if you notice, if you've been following this, um, there was this rotation in emerging markets. Uh, when the Russian crisis hit, the... Um, Eastern European markets, which were very inflated, Hungary, Poland, um, and the frontier markets, Slovenia, Estonia, those things were in the stratosphere. They crashed big time. Like they went down 30%, 40%. They bounced back some. I think they're still shorts, but the currencies kind of cracked. And then they, anyways, at the time. And people rotated, emerging market managers rotated into Latin America because you got to be long, right? So Latin America, rep markets rally. Brazil, and you saw these stories, you still see them. It's the bottom for Brazil. It's so great. You know, everything's changed. It's gone. Sorry, everything just reversed. So all of a sudden, in the last two weeks, um, the uh, there are ETFs on these, by the way. There's a Brazilian equity ETF, a Mexico um, uh, ETF in dollars. Um, those are all sh big shorts to me. So the currencies... Dollar is just turning up versus Latin America currencies. So emerging markets, I think, are in a world of hurt. They're in a world of pain. The, the stronger dollar is like a gigantic margin call for EM. EM. Bad news. You know, and of course, China is the biggest EM, so that kind of contradicts what I was saying. But China might be on a different um, life path. Not, not yet, like I said, but it's approaching in a, maybe a month or two. But uh, forget... Latin America, if you went, if you got long Latin America, God bless you, you know, take your profits, um, get out and go short. That's my recommendation. I think it's EWZ, I forget, EWM, something like that. Those are the tickers. You have to check those out for sure. But anyways, dollar reversing. Uh, ver so the, the, the Latin American currencies are forecast to weaken. Fresh signal. Direction down for EM currencies, Latin America. And, and that's going to make that's going to be very make it very difficult for the equities in those countries too. So capital outflow that's what the stronger dollar is about. The dollar up is capital out, out capital returns to the dollar comes out of emerging markets. Um, it's really bad news for emerging markets. And um, there's one other thing I, I'd like to say that for the next maybe the next time I get a chance to talk here in a minute. Uh, I want to talk about European stock rotation, but I'll, I'll turn the podium over here to George. Michael, another question for you just quickly, because you mentioned currencies. I know the yen looks like crap, but where do you think the yen could go, Michael? What's your view on the Japanese yen? How bad could it get? Hmm, good question. So we just went 10, went 10 yen, 120 to 130 in a flash. I don't see why I couldn't do that again. Um, uh, there is the potential. So what we have is we have the market trying to install discipline on a country whose monetary um, authorities have been completely out of control for years and years and years. So basically, it's going to force, like, think about what's going to happen. The yen keeps weakening. They're trying to support the JGB market at this ridiculously low level by adding more and more um, credit to buy lim unlimited amounts of JGBs right as their currency is weakening. This is crazy. This is like Turkey or, you know, Zimbabwe kind of stuff. So good question. I'd say I just off the seat of the pants, back of the envelope, another 10 yen, kind of easy. Not right, you know, not this afternoon or anything. But um, And then that forces a major change in the whole regime of, of monetary and fiscal policy in Japan. And by the way, I have the same... Um, the rotation in Japan is just like it was, like I told you, in the U.S. So I, I follow the topics, industry groups, and these will be very familiar to George, of course, because he's the expert in international investing in Japan in particular. So I have the things that you want to be long in Japan to outperform the index are the same kind of stuff, you know, as in Europe, I mean, as U.S. 
So here's the top ones, electric power and gas, pharmaceuticals, oil and coal, foods, real estate, um, fisheries and agriculture. If you look at, remember I do ratio charts, this is all in the report. These are all really, really depressed. These, these are just totally out of fashion. And what's in fashion that wants to underperform in, the, in Europe, in Japan, I mean, marine transport. Of course, you know, the, um, the, the freight rates have been so high for so long, but the, that, that sector, marine transport, it went to the moon and it's turning down, it's rolling over. Securities, Nomura, things like that. Electrical appliance, that's the tech group. Um, wholesale, glass and ceramics, banks. So we have, again, we have this major defensive shift in rotation shaping up in Japan. And maybe in a few minutes, I can talk about Europe. Um, but um, back to you, George. Thank you, Michael. Please mute yourself. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to mute you, Michael, because you're not muting. Okay, so we're going to go to Deer Point, And then after Deer Point, we're going to go to uh, Russ Dixon. So Deer Point, good to see you. What's up, my friend? What's on your mind? What's your question for Michael? Hey, hey George. Um, Michael, I, I, I kind of came in midway, so I wasn't sure if you kind of touched on where you, your model was saying that the, the S&P would most likely be. And also, um, maybe uh, looking at uh, credit spreads, because I, I just find things very uh, odd. You know, people say, oh, this is all priced into the equity market. But um, between, you know, the Fed's balance sheet and, and the federal funds rate, we're looking at 350 basis points of, of net tightening. Um, and to put that into perspective for people who don't know, 2018 was only 200 basis points. And I don't think for many people who were long the S&P at that time, that was a walk in the park. Um, but it, it seems like the S&P... Um, and and credit spreads are, are kind, especially credit spreads uh, are are really seeming to lag behind in terms of pricing and rate hikes. I, I think really the only place I'm seeing that's in the treasury market. I think the six month today was at like 90 basis points. So I just didn't know if you maybe had any um, insight to why you think that that was happening. Sure, uh, good question. Um, yeah, credit spreads. I I'm I'm long the option adjusted spread. So I have model forecast up for high yield spreads and EM spreads. And um, they really, I've used the Merrill Lynch, um, somebody bought them out, uh, but it's still called Merrill Lynch indexes. That, that's been the benchmark indexes forever. Um, and uh, they they took Russia out. So the, the, the EM spread gapped enormously on Russia when the when the Russian Ukraine thing hit and then they took Russia out of the index and it went all the way back down so it's, you know the people who run indexes when something doesn't work they just kind of remove it uh, but anyways yeah i think credit spreads should continue to go up high yield total return index down and it's a difficult short, as I'm sure you're aware, if you're short high yield, you're paying the carry. So you're paying that huge premium, you know, the, the yield in high yield. So it's a bad short, but it's not something that you want to be long anyways. Um, and I think this has major implications for two things. One is um, junk bond shops. So KKR, they just came out with great earnings, Blackstone, places like that. Um, uh, those guys have been skating uh they've been getting away with murder forever you know so they basically you know i'm not a fan of the business of borrowing money and then you know so la soaking lo loading a company up with debt and then taking paying yourself big money and then it works in the in, during the boom but then the companies go end up going bankrupt so anyways i, I would just point out the implications for stocks like kkr and bx that's blackstone those are big shorts to me. Asset managers are big shorts to me. Um, also, BEM, that's Franklin. That's an emerging market. And they've, they've got the biggest emerging market bond fund. Um, that guy, uh, you know, one of my clients pointed out that the, the EM bond fund at Franklin has is loaded with some of the most illiquid stuff you could ever imagine that he'll never be able to get out with. And this guy's an old EM debt guy, so he knows what he's talking about. Okay, that's one thing. The other point I'd like to make about that, about spreads widening, is um, that could be bullish for treasuries, ultimately. Not now. Again, I'm not long bonds. I'm flat. I'm looking for a potential bottom in bonds sometime. Not, I'm not, I don't know when it's approaching, but it's not there yet. But when the spreads widen, um, that's a flight to safety thing, right? So you sell uh, junk bond, you know, you sell high yield debt and you buy treasuries. 
basically. You, you, so that's another place where there could be this asset allocation shift um, out of risky stuff into safe stuff that could cause a so-called quote unquote crash kind of situation. Uh, okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That's great. All right. So we've got a few more questioners up here. So we're going to go to my good friend, Guy Serendulo, followed by uh, Brian. Hey, Guy, what's up, man? Good to see you, Guy. What's your question? Hey, hey George. Uh, I just wanted to um, chime in on uh, some of the comments Mike made about the downside projections and the indices. I, as a technician, it's you know, scary to use the word crash. People will We'll throw you out the out the window, but um, I had posted a few days back uh, some of the downside projections I get on S and P, Nasdaq Composite, the 100. And the thing that made me nervous when when I started looking at that, and I compared it to some of the um, big indices in Europe, CAC, DAX, and IBEX. Uh, and this is based on the topping formation and the money flow unit work that I do. But I just rattle off what I'm getting for downside. I don't know how we're going to get there. Uh, you know, you could you could be down 30 percent and in two days, or it could be two months, or th you know, six months. But basically, S and P from peak, the, the most recent peak, uh, downside thirty seven percent. The Nasdaq Composite is a projection at thirty percent, and then I think a final at minus forty five. NDX thirty six and a half, CAC thirty four, DAX thirty three point seven five. IBEX down 34%. And I'm glad Michael talked about the uh, uh, software because that's uh, an area where I've been putting on more shorts over the you know, last number of months. But from peak to trough, there's a downside projection of 45%. Now, again, I don't know how we get there, but the the way the tops are showing the, the distributive pattern that I calculate these projections with are all lining up in the same type of, you know, 35 or so percent. So, you know, it's kind of scary, but um, anyway, that it, it's lining up a bit with what Michael's saying. And I, you know, I'm not using the word crash, but uh, you, you're familiar with my work. George and I worked together way back when. So it's all, it's mathematical. It's no guesswork. Um, so anyway, I just want to share what I'm seeing. And then on the TLT, just as a, as an aside, there's um, downside projection to the 96, 99 area. And we're about 118. So that's the first area I will look at for a potential bottom. So anyway, just wanted to share that. Hope it helps. Thanks, Guy. Much appreciated. Sure. Um, terrific comments. All right. So let's go to Brian. Brian, what's up? Hey, George. Thanks. Um, Michael, I just had a quick question um, regarding Japan equities. What does your model show for them, given the situation they're going through right now? Uh Short, uh, so I'm short um, Nikkei, short topics. And I, as I mentioned a second ago, I mean, a couple of comments periods ago, um, the rotation confirms a major risk off move. So you t electric power, these are the groups that are, the chicken longs are supposed to outperform and nobody likes these things, right? So I, it's not like they're gonna go up, but they're probably gonna go down. There'll be a rotation out of, out of tra marine transport that's shipping and securities and things like that into defensive stuff, just like here, electric power and gas, pharmaceuticals, oil and coal, foods. Um, so, you know, the, the one thing I guess you want to worry about is when a currency weakens, sometimes the market can rally. Maybe that's what you're thinking, um, it, what you're getting at. Uh, so that kind of bugs me. I wouldn't say Japan is my number one um, high probability, high high confidence, short at the moment, but it, it, it's it's in there in the world. The world wants to go down. It's it's been held up artificially, and I think, um, as I mentioned before, the policy, the, the the market is going to ultimately cause a major capitulation by the monetary and fiscal authorities in Japan. And that's going to that could be a real disaster for the stock market. So if they finally they've been saying, oh, there's no inflation, oh, no, 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 we don't we can keep buying bonds. You know, they've been saying that forever, getting away with it. Now the currency is crashing. I mean, that is like down to you know this is that's as close to a currency crash to get a ten percent move in a short amount of a few weeks. That's as close to a crash as you can get in the currency market in a major currency market. That's kind of unheard of. So um, yeah, I think that, that the market will ultimately force them to uh, change policy, that means no more 
funding money, no more QE, no more limit, unlimited buying of JGBs. And in order to stabilize the currency, you know, that could be really ugly for Japan. So ultimately, I think we're not there yet, but I think that the, the, the market is going to force them to capitulate, and that could be very bearish for the Japanese stock market. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. All right. Now let's go to, um, we have, um, let's see here. We have, I'm not going to pronounce this right, Surreal Japan. Uh, Surreal, the floor is yours. What's up? Oh, hello. Thank you very much for doing the spaces. It's really invaluable, invaluable for us. The silver versus gold, in yeah. case if you have a major stagflation. Okay. Um, yeah, silver versus gold. Yeah, so we're still... And I'm hearing um, prognosis that this beer market can be might be as long as 10 years. A typical beer market is uh, 11, 18 months. What would be your prognosis? How long can it last? Okay. That's all. Thank I you. All right. Th thank you. Thank you. So, Michael, two questions. The gold-silver ratio, and then also not just the depth, but possible duration, length of this beer market. Actually, it's a very interesting question because... One of my hot buttons has been, you know, we've been in this uh, hyper speed market where we never, you know, everything's done quickly. We get a correction, it's over, back, yada, yada. Okay. We haven't really had a proper beer market. Um, something which is, you know, drag out sandpaper, drip by drip, you know, drip, drip, drip type of bear market. So, two questions. What do you think about the silver gold ratio? And what about the potential for a long, drawn out bear market, which just grinds everybody into the ground? Okay, um, so silver, gold, um, I have no opinion right now. So the market, remember, gives direction, which can be up, down, or neutral. So right now it's neutral. I just don't know, silver versus gold. Um, they both have long-term upward forecast, and silver has been really smashed the last few weeks on not much of a reason. Oh, by the way, there's something I should mention, just uh, as a slight digression here. I, I just changed on base metals. The, uh, so intermediate term, um, base metals, you know, Zinc, copper, uh, nickel, tin, uh, aluminum. Um, those have been longs, in the model longs for quite a while, very successful. You know, of course, there were shortages, you know, when the Russia thing hit. Um, and uh, I think that the base metals are topping. Um, and so this gets, I, I really should have emphasized this before now. Um, I think. We, we are headed, if you notice, the ISM manufacturing index was down like three or four points. It was announced yesterday. Um, the the, uh, the, uh, the S&P 500, if you overlay the S&P 500 and the ISM manufacturing index, it fits like a glove long term. So basically, what that tells you is the stocks go up and down based on the business cycle. And what I'm saying here is we are, um, so right now, the Fed's going to raise interest rates tomorrow by 50 basis points, probably, right? And all they care about is that inflation's so bad, oh, it's the end of the world, you know? I mean, that's what they should have been saying last year, right? Like 12 months ago, what were they saying? At that time, Powell was saying, we're not even thinking about thinking about cutting QIQE or, or starting quantitative trade. We're not even thinking about thinking about it. These guys are total idiots, right? They're so out of touch. I mean, if the market was in charge of interest rates instead of our, these artificial idiots, you know, Politburo, you know, in Washington, D.C., making bad decisions about how they're going to set rates, interest rates would have started going up a long time ago. We wouldn't be in this kind of situation. But um, back to the point. Um, I think we are closer to an approaching recession and business cycle downturn than most people perceive. And what that means is corporate earnings are going to decline, not just miss. So I think we're headed into a period of um, corporate downgrades, co companies announced, pre-announced, yeah, inflation's bad, but also our orders are starting not to be so great. I mean, we're not falling off a cliff in the economy yet, but it's close enough that I think the ISM index, I expect it to go below 50. Right now, I think it's 54, 55. I think we're going below 50, which is negative. That's recessionary levels, probably within the next two to three months. So what that means is a lot of the themes that are out there right now about buying cyclicals and inflation and stuff, I think it might, you know, particularly with my um, 
sorry, this is a digression from your exact question, but I, I, want, I forgot to put this in earlier. Um, base metals might be the first canary in the coal mine here. So um, they were bid up to the sky. Basically, wherever, my view on commodities is I'm still mostly long. I still have mostly longs, but they're kind of stale longs. And to, to whatever extent commodities are up based on speculation, where there are um, speculative longs, I think those could be vulnerable. And um, so base metals f could be topping right here. So I, I, I just went this week from long to short on copper, aluminum, things like that. Um, and, uh, and, and what that means is the economy is we're not there, you know, it's not like tomorrow we're going to go, we're going into a recession, but sometime soon in the next few months, the signs are going to start dribbling in and the world is going to be going into a downturn at the same time as inflation is really high and central banks are raising interest rates. And George, like you said, like what, if that's not a recipe for a long-term bear market, I don't know what is, you know, it's just like, they're going to be the, tightening credit at exactly the wrong time, right as the economies weaken and they won't have any choice. You know, they kind of back themselves into a corner because they missed it. So, you know, they were able to cut rates um, going into the COVID crisis, right? So if you remember the Fed dot plots before COVID, that would be uh, um, 2020, so 2019, the Fed dot plots showed rising interest rates forever, right? Before COVID hit. Then all of a sudden, boom, that was completely wrong. They threw that out, out the window. And then all of a sudden they're cutting rates like crazy because the world's slowing down because of COVID and lockdowns. So um, they had room to cut rates. Right now, nobody's got room to cut rates, right? They're still at zero. All they've done is raised rates by 25 basis points so far, right? So this, this is a real bad equation. The Fed's really backed themselves into a corner. And um, so I, I, not only will we have, we, we'll still have lingering inflation. I don't expect inflation to fall, to collapse yet, but we got the early signs of things slowing down. And so at the same time, they'll be raising rates because they didn't raise them before. They, so they can raise them, so they can cut them <laughs> when the economy weakens. But in order to get them to a level where they have to cut rates, they're going to have to raise, you know, at 25 basis points where right, we are stop, now. It's like stop, 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 stop. I'm laughing listening to you. It's like they got to raise them so they can cut them. I get it, Michael. They are so screwed up. It's impossible. Um, all right. So let's, let's take a couple, a couple more questions and we'll wrap this thing up. Hey, hey, Newton, what's up? You got a question? Yeah, mine was very much in line with what uh, Michael was just talking about. Go Bears, by the way. That's Cal Golden Bears. And um, so how, how possibly do you see the energy stocks bouncing back if the materials, if the industrial metal stocks are, are turning over? Since they're most of them like you, you kind of... Hold, hold on, Newton. Let me, inter let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. Bouncing back, I think Michael's saying like it's kind of late. Like I don't want to put words in Michael's mouth, but like this is not a good entry point for energy stocks. I mean, he's got it. I mean, I'll let him elaborate, but he's been bullish energy for a long while, so this is really, it's a very late signal. And, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna. No, no, I, I heard him say that he was. Yeah, that there was going to be a pause in it. So my question was, can they can the energy stocks sort of disentangle from the material stocks or the industrial metal stocks? and reassume some, some strength after okay, the next that, 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 five to that, six fair. weeks. That, that's fair. Mike, you got the question? What do you, what do you, do you, do you do do Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I, I've got a conflict in the different time frames. So this is one of the things, when the long-term signal using monthly data up, still outperformed for energy sector S&P. Um, intermediate term, it's really, really late, okay? So um, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I haven't removed them from my outperform list. They're still top 10, but at the bottom now of the list now. They were at the top until last couple of weeks. Um, so I guess if I just looking at the conflict between the intermediate term, which is looking toppy, three month view, and the long term, which is up, I would say maybe get a correction in energy. Not, um, uh, now, you have to remember, most people, most portfolio managers hated energy. Like I've been long, and energy is like by far the best performing sector, and almost everyone has missed it, right? Like the of big boys, I wouldn't, I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth, but I got such, you know, pushback 
for buying energy stocks starting last year when they were totally in the dumps because of all this ESG nonsense, right? I mean, it might not nonsense. I mean, it's better. I ride bicycles here. I live on an island outside of Seattle and I ride mountain biking every day. I live right by a wonderful mountain biking place. And I, in order to get there, I have to ride about a half mile down the road. And these freaking you know, pick, pickup trucks and dr trucks go by and I'm breathing diesel fumes. And, you know, I'm much happier when the Teslas drive by because it doesn't. So I, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying ESG, all these funds, they, they d despise energy stocks. Okay. Right. So that was a great contrarian indicator. So a lot of those guys probably still have to get squeezed in. And um, Russian, let's just talk about fundamentals here for a second. I'm no big expert on fundamentals, but Russian energy is largely, maybe not completely, but it's headed in the direction of being removed from the market. And Russia is one of the top energy producers in the world, right? So, you know, China is still buying Russian oil and, you know, a few other places are India. But, you know, Europe is talking about close, shutting down all purchases of energy from, from Russia. The U.S. has already done that. So there's, there is, a, you know, if the economy slow down, there will be less in energy demand. So I don't want to open up a whole can of worms here. But basically, long-term bullish on energy, but could expect a correction over maybe two to three-month time frame. Beautiful. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you. Hey, Michael, just one follow-up. Um, what about natural gas, that gas? Uh, same thing. So um, I'm long the physical. Natural gas is actually the strongest uh, in the physical market. I mean, the futures market. Um, that's my best long. The other ones are kind of tired, looking tired too. So crude and Brent and uh, RB, gasoline and heating oil. Those are, look, you know, the intermediate term signals late for those too, not for natural gas. So natural gas is interesting. Um, and obviously, LP LPG is going to be a uh, substitute for Russian natural gas pipelines going into Europe. So um, I have a feeling natural gas could outperform. And, you know, there's stocks, there's horrible stocks that I'm sure you don't like, like Chesapeake, you know, things like that. But that are natural gas plays, those might do better. Uh, but again, the whole theme, I've been long, I've been long in overweight energy stocks for many moons now. And um, it's, I, I, you know, things can always go on longer than you thought. And, um, the when sentiment changes, people can get squeezed in at the end. So it's not like, I, don't get me wrong, I am not forecasting a collapse in energy prices or energy stocks. But um, I just say it's been so successful for so long, the gains are built in there, that I think the, oh, so what changed my mind on this, by the way, this last weekend, so I run, remember I run everything relative, ratios to other things. So what's happening is the defensive stuff, things like, Staples, that's XLP. It, when I run that relative to XLE, so Staples relative to energy is turning up. Same thing for utilities, healthcare, real estate. So it looks like whereas energy is, has the biggest gains absolute and relative year to date, um, the defensive stuff, more defensive, the real chicken longs, the things that don't go up much but don't go down as much when the market falls, those look like they want to outperform energy. Um, three to six, maybe three to six month view. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's go to Jackson and then KFAB. Hey, Jackson, what's up? Hey, guys, thanks so much. Michael, one quick question. Everybody in here that knows me knows that I beat this drum raw. How do I not have an earnings recession this quarter, next quarter, and for the foreseeable future when nothing is translating to the bottom line? Again, all day, every day, all I do is read balance sheets. Many people in this room know me in real life. Hospitality hedge fund. Gouging, gouging, gouging. Still not translating to the bottom line, but, uh, Mr. Balkan, because there are shortages in staffing, et cetera, et cetera, supply chain. None of this is translating to the bottom line. Nobody is profiting at the bottom line. The top line days are gone. We know that. Balance sheets matter again. So how do I not have consecutive earnings recession on top of all the economic calamities? Quick question. Thanks so much, George. Thank you for not muting me for beating my drum raw. <laughs> hey, great question. Sounds like you're more of an expert on the field than I am. I, I, I do forecast earnings, um, S&P 500 earnings. I feed that in. Uh, and basically... It's very simple from my, so all I can do is look at it, tell you the way I look at it from my perspective, which is on the business cycle, 
corporate earnings relative to the business cycle and what the market does. Um, so one of the first things I did at Solomon Brothers was, um, was track the performance of the Dow Jones because that's where we had the data going back the farthest back, uh, you know, when Laszlo hired me. And, you know, the picture of the Dow Jones over the, if you, um, it goes up, this is the idealized pattern. We had data going back to the 1800s, you know, as, as early as they um, calculated the index. So basically, the, the, a bull market generally starts in the depths of a recession. Before the recession ends, when things look terrible, all of a sudden the market starts going up in absolute terms for no reason. So the market looks ahead. And then gradually, um, so it goes up uh, idealized for maybe three to four years goes away from trend, and then there's a mean reversion back to the trend. 200-week average works really well for that, by the way. So it's not ever that absolutely perfect, but the, that's the way earnings go too, right? So the earnings look terrible at the bottom. The market starts going up. The earnings follow. Um, the, the market goes up over the course of the business cycle expansion, which is typically four years, although lately they've been much longer, last few cycles, um, not this one. Um, but uh, then the stock market tends to top and start going down before the earnings start going down. So the market leads because it anticipates. So and th and that's what we've had this time, right? So the Nasdaq peak November nineteenth last year. We're with like six months, seven months now, um, and all of a sudden earnings are not so great. They're not terrible, but they're slowing down. And um, it sounds like you're more of an expert on the subject, but I would expect that based on what I'm seeing in the ISM manufacturing index approaching uh, recessionary levels probably within the next two months, um, leading the economy down. So all the things that look bad now, like shortages and can't get people to, to you can't find enough people to hire and the supply chains, that is gradually in a downturn that might linger for a little while, but it's going to become, in a downturn, it's going to become the opposite problem. It's going to be, oh, wow, my sales, like you're talking about the bottom line. What about the top line? All of a sudden, sales aren't going to be as much, you know, they're going to be coming in less than expected, and then revenues fall. And then we've got these companies that are trading for like 30, 40, 50 times revenues, where the S&P is like three times revenues, which is an all-time high, three point something. Um, what about these stocks that are trading at 30 times revenue, software companies? So, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think we're tiptoeing into an economic contraction. Sounds crazy to say that now, but the stock market's been telling you that for seven months. Seven months, however long it is since November, right? Um, so I think the market is leading. Earnings and revenues will decline, and we'll have a economic downturn, a recession, an economic contraction. And the question is, how long will that last? Um, good question. I, 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 it's way too early. To, you know, like George uh, mentioned, are we going to have a lingering long, a bear market that lasts years and years? Possible. Um, that could be, you know, like uh, George, John Rokes really uh, did some great work on this about in the 70s where it was just, uh, it was a horrible, horrible investment in environment where you know, the 40 some almost 50 percent of the days were up, so you could get sucked into thinking the market's going up while it's going down. But it's actually that was an inflationary environment where stocks traded down and they traded down for a long time, you know. So, um, I guess that's the best answer I can give you. I'm not a big expert on earnings, but I think that, that earnings will decline as the economy weakens, and we're probably tiptoeing in that direction. The stock market's already telling you that. Thanks, Michael. That's a great answer. Um, let's go to KFAB. Hey, my friend KFAB, how are you? What's going on, KFAB? Well, thanks, George. Appreciate that. Hello, Michael. Um, I just wanted to make sure, because I know it's running long here, and I know George is not going to want to keep you too much longer. You, you mentioned uh, something within uh, rotation in Europe or some interesting new tidbits. So if you could expand upon that, I'd be really curious. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I was afraid I wouldn't get to that, get, it, get to it. Okay, so I, I also follow uh, very closely and um, the uh, Euro stocks super sectors. And I drill down to the stocks within the sectors. And um, so 
what what I'm seeing there is very similar to what's happening in the U.S. So the top outperformed prospects currently in the sectors as of this week, yesterday's report, food and beverages, telecom, utilities, oil and gas. Oil and gas, I'm doing these in ranked order. Oil and gas was number one. It's now fallen down to number four. Healthcare, chemicals, there's a few cyclicals, a few basic resources, but they're at the bottom of the list real estate, and a few gold stocks. What's supposed to underperform? Banks. European banks look terrible. Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, they're just breaking down. So these are shorts to me. Um, my apologies if any of these guys are listening on the <laughs> Twitter space, <laughs> Deutsche Bank strategists. <laughs> but um, the, I'm telling people to short these things. Commerce Bank, Deutsche Bank, Caxa Bank, Unicredit. Um, they, by the way, if you look at these, they, cra- they, they had a major decline when the Russian thing hit. Then they bounced big time, and they're just rolling over again. So this, is, to me, is a great entry point for shorts on European banks. After that, um, autos. So, you know, Germany is just basically one big automotive production facility, right? You know, all the, they have the, you know, Solantis, Volkswagen, Renault. I mean, that's French. BMW, Daimler truck, et cetera. All these... And all their suppliers and everything, these stocks look terrible to me. They and they're really overowned. So I get the sense that, you know, one thing I've learned: the rotation. What makes stuff goes down is that people are way overweight this stuff, and the, all of a sudden, font someone Goldman or someone finally says, "Oh, we're downgrading Stellantis. Oh, we're downgrading Volkswagen," and the the, port, the slow moving sheep portfolio managers say, "Bah." You know, oh, it's time to sell. And all of a sudden, Volkswagen starts going down. So I think that's what we're sitting on. I think uh, car makers are, are, are short. Technology. Now, there's not as many big, there's no like uh, Fang equivalent. There's a few, you know, Infineon, things like that in Europe. But um, I have these stocks like Bezzi, that's uh, semiconductor, Alten, French software, Nordic Semi, Softcat, Ericsson, Logitech. Infineon, ST, Micro, these things, a lot of these are overowned. big downside. I think these are great shorts. So by the way, I, I have shorts. The model gives short ideas. They're really non-consensus shorts. Like here I am telling people to short the stocks that most people are overweight long. So I, I'm, you know, I'm sort of a contrary and I have short ideas, but they're really non-consensus for the most part. And also industrials look really bad. So this reinforces the idea that the world's headed into a recession. So I have the industrial goods and services sector as a major fresh underperformed sector in Europe. That's Sandvik, Volvo, Rolls-Royce, Maersk. So Maersk, again, it's like um, the shipping company in Japan which these stocks went to the moon and now they're rolling over. Um, so that's a sign, symptom of the world slowing down, right? Shipping, not so much demand for shipping. Rates start falling, not so many shipping containers going back and forth anymore. Uh, Thyssen, Deutsche Post, Ferguson. Uh, retail, the retail stocks have been destroyed in Europe, but they're still like further to go. B&M, Caring, things like that. That's been the weakest by far group in relative performance. Travel and leisure. Now, people keep flocking into these things, airlines, Lufthansa, but I, I have those rolling over. So, but yeah, they raised, you know, I'm buying tickets to go. I have to do some traveling this summer, man. The, the flights are, the prices, ticket prices are way up. But um, I have Lufthansa as a short, fresh one. And then a few more insu- uh, financial groups, insurance in Europe. So these are the sells and shorts. The, and these are probably the core longs for a lot of slow moving um, portfolio managers. But I, you know, invest tech, investor, these asset managers in Europe, Jupiter is down a lot, but it looks like it's rolling over again. And um, so the kind of stocks that want to go up over there, really boring stuff. So Unilever, this stock's, I mean, I don't think this is like, we're, this is not a momentum long, but it's a fresh long. It's a, um, Obviously, they're getting hit by uh, inflation, is, you know, is a problem for them. But, you know, they might be able to raise prices. But it's, it's just a very, very out of favor stock. So if you're looking for a defensive long, things like Nestle, Unilever, Carlsberg, Danone, uh, t- telecom stocks, Telefonica, Telenor, Telia, uh, tele- Deutsche Telekom, things like that, utilities, Iberdrola, 
oil and gas, so they're still there, Repsol, things like that, a lot of the smaller ones, healthcare, a few, um, they're further down the list. But anyways, you get the idea, same sort of long, short idea, the defensive chicken longs. If you're a hedge fund, I think there's a great long, short pair trade opportunity here. Long the defensive stuff, short banks, autos, technology, industrials, retail, travel, leisure, insurance, and financial services in Europe. That's, that's, that's fabulous, Michael. We'll do a couple more questions and we're going to close the room. Uh, so please keep them brief. Uh, Zulian and then El Capitan. Zulian, you got a quick question for Michael? Yeah, quick question. Just uh, you've mentioned a lot of assets. How about uh, newer assets like digital currencies and what's happening there with a lot of banks starting to implement those? Um, do you think that would be some type of safe haven, something that's actually been used in third world countries? Do you see that as uh, kind of taking a different position moving forward? Okay, crypto, right? That's I think that was a question, yeah? Um, yeah, essentially. So, yeah, essentially. yeah, okay, I'm... Uh, I follow um, Bitcoin, and uh, yeah, it's almost a short. So um, I think Bitcoin has become a speculative asset, and um, I think it's vulnerable to a shakeout. Longer term, um, obviously, there's a short, you know, there's a limited amount, and people like it, and so they'll flock to it. And it's, uh, you know, I'm not a... Uh, you know, I'm not a total Luddite about crypto, but I just look up on, I look on it in the model forecast, just like I look at anything else. Long term is down. Intermediate term is almost down. So I'm on the brink of pushing the, pushing the button to short Bitcoin. Not quite yet with probably within the next week or two for three month view. So I just think it acts too much like the NASDAQ, you know, it's become highly correlated to the stock market. So the same people that don't think the stock market's going down that are still like buying the dips. I think they're still buying the dips in, in crypto, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Same thing. I follow Ethereum too. Same thing. So uh, whereas longer term, I'm with you, like the world is changing and these, these things, particularly Ethereum could become sort of the, the backbone of a lot of other stuff. That's obviously the story. And, you know, there are all these applications that could develop. So um, longer term bullish, short term uh, could become a major short within the next week or two. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Um, um, a couple more. We're going to be done here. Okay. So, um, Eric, you have a question, please? Eric? Uh, MQ, Eric, unmute yourself. Or MQ, unmute yourself. MQ or Eric, you got a question? Yeah, I'm here. MQ, it's, it's your turn. What's up? Thanks so much, George. Really appreciate you hosting these awesome spaces. Michael, thanks so much for your time today. Um, another quick question on energy. Wondering if you've looked at the Canadian energy sector at all, Canadian oil and gas names. We've seen some very strong results coming out of Q1. Strong free cash flow yields. These guys are paying down debt, in some cases announcing stock buybacks. Do you see some potential in that sector i know you said you were a little bearish maybe in the short term on energy but what do you think do you think those ones stand apart it's a little bit of an underlooked sector from the american perspective just wondering if you had any thoughts thanks sure uh so suncor right su that's one of my um that's the number three um on my list um you know that's oil sands um and so i mostly just follow the the U.S. listed ones, but there's a lot of Canadian, there's Canadian ones that are listed in the U.S., so they're on my list. But um, same general view, like it's just late, you know, like big things can happen at the end of moves. But having been in this thing, again, I've been pushing energy stocks, you know, you know, before they were popular. And I've been getting the pushback for so long and now finally people are are piling in. And I'm saying like, hello, where have you been? So I just think it's kind of a stale theme. Um, and it could be the, just from a price perspective. Uh, now I'm talking with, you're talking to somebody who this is on my top 10 buy list still. Okay. But it's more of a hold than a buy. But um, I just say the energy pipelines look better to me. They, they, they just look, they're more defensive. Um, they have a higher dividend yield, 8% AMLP. That's the um, energy MLP. If, so that, that's all I can say is if you're into energy, the one thing I'd recommend at this point is 
pipelines, um, high yielding AMLP, that's an ETF. And other than that, their holds, I would rather like hold them, look to maybe look for a shakeout, maybe look to get back in um, if you do get out after a few months. Thanks so much. All right. So, Michael, um, this has been great. So, again, um, just to resummarize, Michael uh, Belkin is the uh, proprietor of the Belkin Report. He's been absolutely on fire. I can't think of another analyst who's had a better call than Michael. Um, he, uh, if you go to my Twitter feed, he's, you can see there's a link to a 20% discount for the next 48 hours. He offers a stripped down version of his very high end, expensive industrial uh, institutional product for it's an incredible bargain. He's offering a 20% off sale for the next 48 hours. So uh, if you go to um, it's in my it's in my Twitter feed, uh, just take a look at it. It's the last thing I tweeted out. You can go to hyperpron.com, h y p e r h y p e r p y r o n hyperpron.com for twenty percent discount code spaces, or just look at my tweet. You'll find all the information there. The other thing I'd like to say is to remind everyone, um, you know, we've had an incredible outpouring of support we're trying to raise money for world central kitchen um we've gone from nothing to oh my gosh uh a hundred and a hundred and three thousand um and we're actually at a hundred and uh twenty three thousand twenty twenty five thousand because we've had a very very generous leadership matching pledge by uh, alexander he's in the second row i see he snuck into the room recently He's a real inspiration for us all. He came into the room on Saturday and lit up the place and really inspired others to give generously. This is a community. We're all helping each other. This is the best Twitter space, period. We have the best speakers. We have the best content, the best moderation, and the smartest audience. And also, we're doing something good. We're helping people in need. Uh, it was I almost broke into tears when Alexander... Um, made his generous pledge offer on uh, Saturday, and it was met. Um, we had a ten thousand dollar pledge in response, and, I, and I'm very confident we're going to we're going to we're going to make Alex Alexander pay. He he likes to pay. You're going to make him pay. And so I need everyone to help gang up on Alexander and give him a run for his money, literally speaking. So again, it goes for a fantastic cause. You know, World Central Kitchen. They're helping people really in need. We're very fortunate to be here in a room. This is a first world problem. We're trying to maintain and increase our net worth. There are people out there who are really hurting and need our help. And the least we can do is give back and try to make the world a better place. So again, I want to call out Alexander for his incredible support. Everybody else in this room has been awesome. Michael, I want to thank you for coming to this room again. Um, <laughs> I hope you're wrong, <laughs> but I don't think you're going to be wrong. And I just take a lot of comfort from the fact that the smartest guys I know, uh, I see Tommy Thornton in the second row, Guy Serendulo, we had John Roken here, Shrub. I mean, we're all kind of saying the same thing. I mean, we're going to be wrong, but I don't think it's group thing because this is a real distinct minority. So, um, again, I salute you, Michael. Thank you so much for coming to the room again. I hope you'll come back. And, again, everybody – Michael's offering a special uh, discount of uh, 20% off for the next two days. Go to, go to my Twitter feed for, and you'll see the link to hyperpron.com or go to at hyperpron. The, uh, uh, BR2 report is a stripped down version of the very expensive, uh, high institutional product. And it's an incredible bargain. So I can't, I would, I, I read the report every week. I, I can't urge you strongly enough to do likewise. So again, I want to thank everybody for coming to the room tonight. It's been awesome. We'll do it again tomorrow, by the way, um, just so everyone knows, Peter Atwater, Peter Atwater, who's a professor of behavioral economics at William & Mary, he's going to be speaking in our room at 4 o'clock. You really need to hear this guy. He's unbelievable if you haven't heard him before. He basically um, helps explain why people do dumb things with their money. So, like, why are people buying, you know, mortgages or taking out mortgage in the, in the, in, 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 in the meta space or whatever the hell it is? Like, why do people do AMC 8 type stuff? 
basically when they when they, they feel they're, not, they're they're outside the system they're outside looking in and they have no no shot and they've got this sort of dystopian view of the world sort of fatalistic view of the world they start to do crazy stuff and so i've heard peter speak before he's really a treat um and he he he's able to meld the the, the practical with the financial with the theoretical it's really really interesting so please four o'clock tomorrow peter Atwater. Again, Michael, thank you for um, coming to the space. Alexander, thank you for your leadership. Shrub, Guy, everybody. Wish everyone a good night, and we'll see you all tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Take care, everybody. Good night.